Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to show you how I built the spell lab for the game Atlas Empires. This will be sped up footage with a commentary over the top. If you want to see any in-depth tutorials on the things I'm doing here then check the playlist in the description. And also check the description for other courses that I do. There's lots of information in there. So for those that don't know I've been working on a game called Atlas Empires. It's available now and you should check it out. It's definitely worth it. I still play it myself and you can friend me on there. My name's Grantius. And I've made all the buildings and some of the icons and things like that. And it's a mobile game and these objects are quite small on the screen. So you don't need to go too detailed when you're building these sort of things. And they don't have things like normal maps or cavity maps or anything like that. You just build your model with a very sort of low poly base and then you draw on top of it with texture maps. So just an albedo or a diffuse. All the highlights and shading and things like that, that's all painted on. So to be able to produce objects with this style, you need a good understanding of things like shading, obviously, but mainly texturing and how to draw different materials like wood and stone, but also how to draw things like metal, which are shiny. And that's quite a tough one, really. Now, when you're doing low poly modeling like this, you can have separate meshes. As you can see here, they're all tiny meshes building up to make one model. You don't have to make everything one model. And that's kind of important, really, because one, it takes longer to model, and two, it can have a higher poly count because of it, because you're trying to attach things to other things. And just putting one object against another or overlapping it slightly is absolutely fine, so you mustn't worry about those sort of things. Also, you don't need to worry about triangles because it's not being animated. Even if it is animated, it's not always the biggest problem. The problem with triangles is that it's harder to model with triangles. You can't do loop cuts through them and things like that. So triangles are not a big problem. Overlapping geometry is not a big problem. It's actually very helpful to have separate meshes because when you come to paint, you can fill them in different colors without having to mark loads of extra seams. So you can see here as well that I use very basic modeling techniques, just pulling the mesh around, cutting things out. Again, I'm not too worried about the topology. The most important thing is to try and do this without too many cuts and polygons. The more faces you have, the bigger the file size for downloading the game, and also the performance might have issues. You can get away with quite a lot, to be fair, but try and minimize it where you can. There's no point in having lots of loop cuts around an object, or bevels everywhere, or even subdivision surface modifiers when you're dealing with low poly objects. There's also a kind of stylized aspect to it where they're sort of chunky and blocky in some way. And that's, of course, down to the studio you're working for, or the people you're working for and the style they'd like to see. Now generally I do everything with box modeling so I just start with a box or a cylinder and pull things apart. But occasionally I'll use modeling tools like here I'm using curves and these will turn into pipes eventually. It's sort of easier to get them in line and uh, make them work when you go from a curve to a mesh. You can convert these curves into a mesh of course. You do have to keep an eye on your poly count so uh, when you make this curve a hole you need to think about the resolution of it so you turn that right down uh, so you've got a sort of low poly pipe. Like I say for the most part I stick to cubes but every now and again I'll use a cylinder and that's about as far as I go in terms of the meshes I start with and then it's just a case of pulling them around adding verts and pushing them into position. I try and copy and paste things where I can and then modify them rather than restart one of the other things that I often do is, with cylinders especially, is to use a mirror on both the X and Y. It doesn't save any polys, but it does save you texture space. So you've only got a certain amount of texture space to paint on because you have to make the resolution of the textures quite small for low poly games, which is often more important than the poly count these days. So if you've got a mirror, you can mirror both sides and only paint half of it and therefore only use half the texture space. So you can see the resolution of the pipe work there, so it's quite low and you're able to set that. The only problem is they don't connect to each other quite well, so you have to smarten these things up quite often. And you can see me making a bit of a mess of it here, to be honest, uh, but you get there in the end. Lots of the time I end up doing that, sort of deleting a face and then adding it in later. That's a nice easy way to edit a low poly mesh. So there's lots of use of the knife tool and then filling in faces with the F key, merging vertices as well. So I eventually got the pipes to all work together by sort of cutting them into each other and they look fine. Now here you can see me extruding a sort of section of it. You have to be a little bit careful with this sort of thing because it does add a few polys but I think it really looked quite nice so I decided to go with that sort of joints on the pipes to give it a bit more sort of realism I suppose. 
it's tiny features like that that can make quite a big difference so where you need to use um, the poly count and increase it then just go for it because those small amount of polys isn't going to make a huge amount of difference but it does make a big difference to the final image and how nice it looks with these tiny details and things you've got to try and avoid inside faces so this pipe for example will probably have an end cap and you obviously don't need that when you're jutting it up against another object like this You can see me here minimizing the distance that these objects are digging into the main sort of building. And that's mainly to save texture space. It doesn't actually make any difference to the poly count, but it will take up space on the UVs. Now you can see here I've used a tiny bevel on the edge of the sign. So some of the corners you might want to just bevel or pull them in a touch. It it's quite tough to know and it takes a bit of experience to know when to sort of bevel your corners and when not to but if there's any really sharp edges they can be a bit jarring to look at so I tend to where possible get rid of any really sharp corners when modeling anything with sort of detail that's fairly flat then I'll probably just do a cutout like I have here on a plane and then I'm mirroring it across the other side and then I'll fill in all the detail I quite like that technique of starting with a plane. I find it nice and simple to model shapes in that way. Okay, so I'm getting ready for the texturing aspect now. I put a plane on the floor to make sure all the bases actually sit on the floor, but it doesn't need a plane when I export it. You can see into the hut slightly, so a sort of cauldron and things like that in there made a lot of sense. Some people ask about the concept art, so I thought I'd put that in the top right for a moment here. You can see the starting point, and it is just a starting point, and the lead artist is just sending me some ideas. And that's something, as I've worked with them and the project, that sort of the confidence builds up and uh, their confidence in me builds up. So they're happy for me to push these things in a different direction. And more recently, they've just given me a few sort of words as a brief rather than an actual image. Obviously, the more you work with people, the more you know what they want and what their expectations are. And their trust in you grows as well, so you can kind of be confident that you're both going in the same direction. Now, because these are all different objects, you'd expect there to be a problem when you unwrap. But it's actually really easy. You just select everything and press unwrap, and it puts it all onto one map. So you select everything in edit mode, that is, and unwrap. So it's really quite nice and easy, so that's great. Now I did do an unwrap there, but then I suddenly remembered that I need to go through and delete the inside faces that we're not going to see because that saves a bit of space. Also in this case, I applied some of my mirrors because I wanted to be able to shade the backside of th some of these things. So I didn't actually want a mirrored texture in this case. And I needed a mesh inside the whole hut because if you see the back of a face, it doesn't actually render in unity. Unlike Blender, you can turn that off in Blender, but you can see the insides of faces and that doesn't come through in a game engine. So I had to actually build the inside of the hut as well. And I made the UVs for the inside very small because they're not going to be a sort of obvious thing that we're going to see. They're in the background and you hardly notice them. You might as well make the UV space for them much smaller. Now sometimes I'll go around marking seams, sometimes I'll do an automatic unwrap. When you're painting an object, you can get away with an automatic unwrap, a sort of smart UV project, rather than having to go around marking all the seams. But sometimes it's better to mark the seams because you get a better unwrap. You can also do a smart UV project to start with and then tidy up the seams from that. So there's several ways of doing it and it kind of depends on time and how well the smart UV project has performed. So I'm going around uh, just painting things in. You can see that obviously I make the edges, the very corners of the wood a bit brighter. That's that classic sort of low poly object uh, type of look. And you do get a slightly lighter edge on most objects when you look at them, but it's very much exaggerated and stylized with this sort of type of painting. You can see I put a shader editor up the top left and I always have that there because I like to be able to work with just the emission node plugged into my texture and that gives you an exact replica of what it's going to look like when you've finished. So you plug it into the viewer node with the node wrangler and that's all important for seeing the final output but you can't see the corners very easily. So I have that ready so I can just click on the principal BSDF and then use that as my shading. That will show me where the corners are and then I can find them for my lighter spots. So occasionally you'll see me jumping from the viewer node to the principal BSDF node as the sort of material output. 
Now this type of painting does take a long time and it's very difficult in many ways to judge how much detail you should go into because you've got to consider how big the screen's going to be for different people and they could be playing this on a tablet not just a mobile phone and how far in they're going to zoom in and how big this object is going to be in your scene. So this is kind of an important object so I did go a bit further with the painting on this one and probably a bit too far as I usually do. I'll go a little bit over the top. Uh, I'd rather do that than do too little and have to go back to it because it's really problematic to go back to these objects and repaint them. I certainly am having a lot of fun doing this and I really love doing this sort of painting type artwork and this type of modelling. But I do sometimes wonder about the future of this type of workflow. At the moment, it's still important for mobile games to have hand-painted textures. And it possibly always will be because the stylized elements can be tough to replicate artificially, so procedurally. So I sometimes wonder whether AI is going to take over my role as an artist. And as devices become more powerful, then we'll be doing things like more normal map baking and so forth for mobile games. But that can be time consuming as well because you have to do some sculpting and so forth. It's probably a little bit quicker than painting, but there's not really much in it. As for computers taking over, well, that's kind of inevitable eventually. But for now, I can still have lots of fun painting in these textures. Now, every now and again, you may see a slight mistake. So I used the same texture for the back piece of wood as the front piece of wood. And that was a bad idea because I forgot that the top pieces of wood were sitting on the bottom piece of wood and therefore would have shadows on the bottom piece of wood. So I had to re-unwrap the back piece of wood. <laughs> How many times can you say pieces of wood? And then I had to sort of uh, put them for find a space for them on the texture map. So you can see my texture map on the left hand side there at the bottom and I had to find tiny spaces for the back piece of wood. And I think I might have to do that for another object somewhere else later on, but I can't quite remember. Lots of people ask me how long this takes, and it's a fair few hours, to be honest, to, for the whole building. Like I say, I probably go a little bit further than I need to, but I do really enjoy putting that detail in. So, like I said earlier, I probably go a little bit over the top with some of these. The people at Atlas Empire seem fairly happy with what I'm doing, so I'm quite pleased that they're happy with the results each time, so that's all great. On the roof tiles here, you can see that I like to make them slightly different shades or different colours. I think that gives it a bit more character rather than just making it really one bulk colour. And you can see also that I'm drawing in those dents and crevices, and that's kind of the essence of low poly work. So where there's a silhouette, you need to kind of model and shape it. Uh, but where there's a flat surface that you need to give the illusion of depth, that's when you start painting. So the silhouette and the outline is all important. So if you're seeing it from different angles, you need to have an extrusion for that. One thing you might come across occasionally is flip normals, which are the reverse direction of the faces. So when you're painting, it's just not coming out or it's not appearing on your object. That's because the normals are facing the wrong way. I like the fact that Blender's put that in the overlay. So you just quickly go in there, check the face direction and flip them if you need to. Another problem I've sometimes come up against is duplicating an object and forgetting about it. So you've got two objects right on top of each other and you're trying to paint and you're getting flickering and all sorts of errors. The quickest way to deal with that is just remove doubles. So select everything and remove doubles. That's if you've done it in edit mode. If you've done it in object mode, you actually just have to go in and delete the extra object that's there. But that's something to look out for. So you can see this kind of steampunk vibe going on here with the sort of brass and the metals. When I first started doing this Atlas Empires work, I was quite scared of metals and there was quite a lot of metal to draw, but now I've really got the technique a bit more sorted and solid in my mind. Now the thing that I'm more worried about is when I see glass, so the potion bottles and this middle bit of this, whatever this thing is anyway. And that can be a really tricky one. You can't really paint glass realistically. You have to see it as fogged glass. That's the only way to really do it. So you give it a sort of foggy look and maybe give it a glow in the middle or something like that. It can be really tough though. My absolute favorite brush setting or blend mode for this is the dodge, the color dodge mode. And you can see my blend modes on the right hand side there. Sometimes it's the multiply, sometimes it's the color dodge. The color dodge is really great for metals and especially if you sort of push it off to a different sort of hue, you can get some really nice interesting effects. It took me a little while to marry up the hues and the tone of the different pipes 
because I was p painting them individually so uh, matching them up at the end was a little bit tricky. It's not too bad because they're separate objects you can just select them and then uh, use the multiply or screen or even the color dodge tools uh, as a fill so you can sort of bring them up to the same levels and it's not too bad. It's also a bit of a pain if you've used the mirror option on your textures for shiny metals because they'll have the same reflection either side and that's a bit frustrating so I try to avoid that where I can where I can get away with the polys. So you can see here I've tried to make some of the pipes copper and some of them brass and it takes a fair bit of time this does a fair bit of editing but it can be a really re rewarding process. Okay so here I'm making the stone and the bricks I think those are the three things that you must know how to draw if you're going to do sort of low poly objects and that's wood, stone and metal. I suppose that might seem fairly obvious but pretty much everything's made up of that. So if you want to become a texture artist then I would thoroughly recommend focusing on those things. Well for buildings anyway, I suppose clothing for characters of course. I usually draw the outline of the bricks first and then just sort of fill in the shade and give them a sort of bobbliness so the light's always coming from the top so you um, shade the underside of some of the bricks and it gives them that sort of stony structure. And you can see that I'm working on the glass here. I'm using the smudge brush a fair bit just to create some sort of potiony blobbiness in the middle and then the dodge brush to sort of make it glow from the inside. And then I actually use some of that glow on the other metals to make them as if they're shining and it's shining onto the metal and reflecting. Uh, and I was really quite pleased with that in the end. I thought that looked quite good and effective. And you can occasionally see me add bits in and I uh, have to re-unwrap them and so forth and put them into my UV map on the left hand side. These inside maps I did actually make slightly smaller but I should have made them smaller still even. And I mean on the actual texture map I should have made them smaller to take up less space but at this point I'd have to rebake everything to use up and utilize the space so there was no point but I should have done that. So even though I have been doing a lot of this now I'm still making the odd error here and there. It's more an optimization thing so it's not completely optimal and if I wanted to make it really 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 optimal I would have to rebake and reposition some of the UVs but it's really not worth it for any gain you're going to get in the game. I really like doing these bigger objects rather than the sets. With the sets you have to repeat objects so you can't actually put as many shadows and shade in because they'll end up repeating and you might sort of take a part of that object away. So you have to be very careful with the shadows that you use but for this I can really go to town and have some fun drawing it in the style that I really like. Of course if you want to check out the ob other objects that I've drawn and painted they are in the playlist in the description so do check them out and maybe take a look at one of the sets that I've done and hear me talking about the differences and see the different ways I've painted because individual objects uh, you can get away with a lot but if they're sharing the UVs you have to be very careful about where you put the shading and shadows. Here's the glass again, the potion bottles which scare me but again you can see I've just sort of done cloudy textures and then given them a bit of a glow and I think that worked in the end so I've, <laughs> I've come across to the technique that I like the most for using potion bottles. And you can see here that I accidentally forgot to uh, do lots of repeated potion bottles so I need to find some space for them and then uh, bake that one potion bottle, uh, put it somewhere else in the UV map and then give it a different colour. It was actually fairly easy in the end but complicated to think about more than, uh, but easy to paint if that makes sense. A few cracks on the plaster, that's always very important, give it some old age look and we're pretty much there now. That's that final stage where you start putting in these really fine details like notches and splits and there's some um, fluids leaking out of the tank and stuff and that's really good fun. It suddenly gets some real character when you start doing those sort of things. And there we have it, the spell lab. I'm really pleased with this one. I think it came out really well and it is nice doing those individual objects rather than the sets because you can really add some character elements and really go to town with the shading. Um, I do enjoy it. So well done if you've managed to get this far through the video, let me know if you have in the comments below and if you've got any thoughts or questions then do ask, I do read all the comments so uh, please do comment below and let me know what's going on. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.